My firm has been looking at this whole issue of diversity in depth around the globe for the last five years. And I'd like to share with you today some thoughts of what we're learning and then more importantly, the things we have yet to figure out. And to start that out, take a look at those photos. I'd like to talk about what the difference is between those two. One is a plantation and the other is a rainforest. They represent entirely different models. When we look at a plantation, we're looking at the agricultural model, which is built on complex formulas to get productivity. We get rewarded for yield. We get honored for actually increasing what we can get out of the time and the money that we spend. The rainforest, on the other hand, is spontaneous. It is unplanned, it is undetermined, and it produces all kinds of remarkable flora and fauna that can be used for value in herbs and medicine and wonderful species of things that we don't even know what to do with, but we discover. Now, that poses for us what in management parlance is called a leadership dilemma. We want both. They're both good, and they're good for different reasons. On the one hand, we'd like to get rewarded for productivity and those things that come from it. On the other, we want to have our cake and eat it too by having great spontaneous ideas, things that come from the future that we can use for innovation. Now, Niels Born, who's a physicist, was the first person to coin this phrase, leadership dilemma. It is the notion where you have two profound truths that compete with each other such that you can't really have both without sub-optimizing sub something. And I would submit to you in today's world, we have a leadership dilemma around this subject of planned growth against innovation, where we know that innovation is the competitive edge factor. And what we've <coughs> discovered in the last few years is that diversity is directly tied to innovation. If we increase diversity, we have an exact increase not exact, but we definitely have an increase in innovation. We know this and the business model and the studies are clear. We've looked at it a million times. We see it, it produces wonderful results in all kinds of things, in external measures, internal measures. It's good, it's good. So we have to define what it is and figure out how to get it. Well, one of the tricky questions with that is what is diversity? And people are debating this on whether it's gender, whether it's ethnicity, whether it's tied to heaven knows what. In, in Africa, it's around tribalism. I would submit to you that one of the things that we've looked at as a precursor to all of that is the style of thinking that comes to the table. It doesn't matter whether that's in a skirt. It doesn't matter whether it's in trousers. But you do have to know that that diversity of thought is around that table if you want real good dialogue and decisions that come out of it. The quality of that is important. Now, we've done studies in 32 countries to look at the orientations of style of thinking and came out with this typology of four healthy styles. We actually have four that are unhealthy as well, but we won't talk about those today. Those of you who are oriented around action or process or strategy or people, all good styles, all good ways of looking at problems. When you bring those four to the table, the dialogue and the quality of decision making gets debated at a different level and you get better outcomes. This is what we look for and what we call a diversity on the board. Whether it's homogeneous all men, whether it's a mix of women. Now, there are some understandings that we get. If we mix it up with women and men, their personal experiences are gonna create some differences in dialogue as well. So it's a good thing to create the diversity around other metrics. It's just that we think this one's particularly important. So if we know all of this, and we know diversity is good, why aren't we there yet? Take a look at this. This is the display of where we have some global regulatory board diversity. Not something we can be particularly proud of at this stage. Norway, Finland, the UK, Australia are pretty moving along on, on stats. Hong Kong's sort of in the middle. And Japan's still asking, what's a woman? They don't know. <laughs> so we have this dilemma. And it what turns out that among many of the dilemmas that we look at that have to do with management interests, 
This one seems to be tougher to deal with than others. Now, why is that? On the one hand, we want harmony. We want to cultivate diversity so that we get both of those at the same time. And there seems to be two fundamental reasons that are in our way. And they're tricky ones. The first one is this notion of trust. If you think about what it takes to build a corporate enterprise within a global economy, look at all of these compounded constituencies that have to work somehow together in an ecosystem for success. The currency of business is trust. Having said that, what we have is a dilemma based on our understanding of our own psychology and our neurology, we are not born to trust. Our fundamental reptilian brain teaches us to survive. When you meet somebody brand new, David, I'm meeting you, I split, I decide on you on six dimensions. Should you be nurtured? Should I nurture you? Should I have sex with you? Should I run away from you? Should I beat you up? Those are the things that I'm parsing within the first few seconds that I meet you. Or should I attack you? That's the, that's the last one. The, the brain is going to that survival skill first. Then it moves up, if you're emotionally highly intelligent, to other dimensions to think about. We are cave people in corporate suits. And when we start, we come from this lack of trust. And then we have to work harder to get over that. And there's very little self-justification as we think about that, that the work is worth it. You know, we don't really trust that we're going to get much value out of the trouble that we go to to work at that. And one of the problems with that is that when we look at it on business models, the, the studies start to show that we don't game well together, we don't socialize to try something experimental together well because we really aren't so sure we, we want to play that game. So we're really uh, wired to avoid loss more than we're wired to tr try for a gain. Now, that's, that's a p particular dilemma, but to prove the point a little more, hang with me on this. Here is the Krobo tribe located in eastern Ghana. Now, I'd like to share a little bit about the, the trusted and sacred ceremony that they hold, which marks the passage of girls moving into womanhood with a series of rituals called daipo. It's been practiced in this country since the 11th century. Now these young women prepare for femininity and fertility under their earth goddess, Nini Kwawiki, and it starts by them severing all ties with their tribe for a seclusion. They go away with their guides, women guides, for three weeks and they learn, they get trained on all of the things required to become a woman within their tribe. And the, the initiates go away for those three weeks and under their guardians, they get prepared. If they get to the stage where they're ready after those three weeks, they go to the last and most important part of their, their ceremony, which is a ritual encounter with a sacred stone called Tepeque. Now to prepare for that, this sacred stone is supposedly a determinant of their virginity and their readiness to become an important woman of the tribe. The way they do that is to be hiked out to where the sacred stone is. Now that stone was hauled down from the mountains uh, many centuries ago when they were evicted by the Brits. So they hold the stone in a, a special grove. They wear pure white, crisscrossed across their, their uh, chest and pure white on their head. They are chalky white fluid put on their body to protect them, to ward off any evil. And then a leaf is put on their tongue so that they maintain silence and reflect on their inner wisdom as they march to this very important <coughs> test. Now imagine, the, they proceed to the grove carrying this stick, which is called demachi, which translates literally to becoming a woman. Looks like fun, huh? Now, when they get there, there are priestesses, and they examine the initiates. They test them for their virginity. 
Now, they believe that when they pour a little water on the stomach of the, of the girl who's laid on the stone, that it will indicate if the stomach trembles in any way that that, that young girl is either pregnant or is not a virgin. Imagine that. The, the girls are placed three separate times on the stone as a test. Now, if the girl fails the test, in older legend, they were thrown off the mountain. Contemporarily, they're just ostracized from the village and they have to go to another tribe to start their lives over again. If they're successful, then they are taken on the backs of one of the guides and race back to the village for a grand celebration. And they are raced that way because they were so prized historically that other tribes used to steal them in the woods on the way back. So there's great fanfare for those that make it and terrible sadness for those that don't. Now, I would just ask you, imagine that you are all on the board of a company that does major infrastructure development and you've just landed from your management team one of the largest contracts of your firm in Ghana. And to cement the deal, the management team has agreed that all of you as board members are going to participate by having either your daughter, your godchild, your niece, someone of dear precious value to you, participate in this ceremony. What do you think? How many of you are going to sign up for this deal? How many of you are going to resign? How many of you are going to run in the back of somebody out of here? <laughs> I am the mother of three children. I'd go to the moon before I'd go through this ceremony with my daughters. Now, imagine in a global world, this is for hyperbole's sake, but the social trust required to create those sorts of relationships across the globe take a very different kind of maturity and openness to close and succeed on these sorts of uh, future deals. Now, if trust isn't an issue unto itself, let's take a second one, which I know some of you are looking at already, but this has to do with unconscious bias. And the research on this is really starting to emerge. We're looking at a number of different ways in which we hold bias, and we don't know it. David Eagleman is a head of neurology at uh, Baylor School of Medicine, and he's looking at the ideas that the brain doesn't lie. We might say, oh, we, we are egalitarian and we like all races and what have you, but he will put a hand inside of a screen and watch as, or have your brain tied up and have you watch while a knife comes down on the hand. And it will model the brain's reaction to that atrocity. Now, he will say it registers at one level with a white hand and then you put a black hand and it's totally different. An Asian hand is totally different. So the level of redress that's going on in the brain will tell you whether you have that bias or not. And we don't necessarily know that about ourselves. We rhetorically think differently than our brain is actually giving us away. There's another story of Carla Kaplan who was a professor at Yale and she liked to put mementos into, into a book, a scrapbook we call it, that keeps sort of a heritage of things that are going on within her family. She was in the kitchen and she cut her hand open inadvertently and it was bleeding and she raced to the hospital. And while she was sitting there, she was explaining to the surgeon who was gonna take care of her hand, it was a pretty bad cut. I'm really worried because I won't be able to do my scrapbooking if my hand doesn't get fixed. And the doctor said, yeah, yeah, okay. And a young intern walked by and said, professor, what are you doing here? And the doctor said, you're a professor? And how do you know this young intern? And she said, well, she's the economist professor at Yale. And the doctor said, excuse me, and he ran out and he got the best surgeon's advice he could possibly get to save her hand. Now, that is what she would call favoritism. Her hand was saved by virtue of his impressions of affinity associated with her as a professor, as opposed to her concern, which had to do with her hand, which she wanted to save for her scrapbooking. That's the total difference that we can see in these sorts of discriminations that are either favoritism or exclusion, one or the other. Now, we're looking at this and seeing it in, in business models around recruitment trends, performance evaluation practices, all kinds of studies now looking at, for example, screeners 
one study on, by ladders on looking at screeners for resumes. On an average of six seconds per resume, they are screening against the names and calling out quickly those that get an interview and the, those that don't. And they had definite bias as opposed to the, the likelihood of a name being a classic European Anglican name compared to something else. Now mind you, this was done by a company, ironically, that had set as an initiative high diversity goals for that year. So innocently, they had people tracking and screening out the very people they wanted. This sort of thing happens also with cover letters for recommendations for people where the cover letters written for men focus on outcomes, results, action whereas the ones for women are about their soft skills, their interpersonal gifts, and guess who gets the interview, or guess who gets the job. These are the things that the organizations today have to start taking a look at if they truly want the due diligence to fix the patterns that are going on without us really paying enough attention. What we really want to do is ask this question like any good psychologist does after seeing a pattern is clear. Now that we know this is true, that we have some trust issues and we have some unconscious bias, what can we do about it? For the future, it's our responsibility to say that we're gonna have to build a new definition of the next generation director. And that person is going to have to work pretty hard as a broker of social trust. And they will have to ma manifest skills that are high diplomacy, high integrative, high influential, high impact people that are mature and wise enough to look conscientiously at some of these patterns that exist within our organizations. And because boards are episodic teams, they don't meet that often, they're gonna have to invest more personal time to get to the point where they actually know each other well and can look at how they become excellent as a team of peer-based leaders. And to give the organization the thorough cuts to take a look at uncovering those biases, stripping them wide open, and straightening out those patterns so that we can move forward. And then to create those sorts of diversity systems that we're gonna talk about all day long here, to create sustained success rather than short-term ahas. And with that in mind, I think we're going to have a great day. Thank you.